So I want to kick off straight away. At the end of the seminar yesterday, mm. I caught you at the very beginning of making quite a uh, quite a statement, quite a claim regarding <laughs> cauliflower ears. <laughs> In the changing rooms afterwards. Yes. What was it? I believe that I've come up with a technique to reverse cauliflower ears after they've ha- after they've hardened. So this could revolutionise the sport of jiu-jitsu <laughs> right now. So please explain. Um, basically, the idea is that obviously, if you get cauliflower ear. Um, you want to ice it first off is the smartest thing to do. And then obviously if it's, if there's a lot of liquid in there, drain it and you've got to drain it, get compression on it. A really smart way to do it is actually to get magnets and to put magnets on either side just to keep it because it would just try and basically you've separated the skin sort of the the material there and there's just filling. So if you drain it and then you leave it, it's just going to do the same thing. So if you get some compression on it and it's hard to get compression on some areas, but magnets work really well. But if you miss your opportunity and it starts to harden, you're not going to be able to drain it at that point. And people are like, okay, my ears are just like this for life. Uh, Unless you get basically cosmetic surgery to get it cut out. However, um, I did have a bit of a cauliflower ear once and I just got into the habit of massaging it constantly. And the idea is that cauliflower ear is basically just scar tissue and you can break down scar tissue in the same way that if you tore your hamstring badly and once it recovered, you'd go to physio and they would give you deep tissue massage or they'd give you grafting and stuff. And the idea is to break down the the scar tissue in the muscle and have it reuptaken by the, by the, the blood and basically get rid of it. I think you do the same with the ear. So I think if you have a cauliflower ear, and you, I mean, you have some people that are absolutely massive. It would take 30 years of constant massage <laughs> to get rid of it. But if you've got a bit of a thickening of the ear, if it's not active, so it's not swollen, it's not painful, you, you, you massage it down, never to a point where it starts to get inflamed or sore, but you're just slowly breaking down that scar tissue. And I think that you can, you can, you can you reverse can, it. You can start to help it. And I said this the first time in a changing room and some guy said to me, he goes, Dan, you're full of shit. <laughs> and he came back three weeks later. He goes, Dan, you're a genius. Yeah, yeah, actually, okay. he did it, yeah. Interesting. So that's something to play around I, with. I don't think I'm ever going to get it. Cauliflower ear? Yeah, don't think so. Mate. Well, you want one? Yeah, you know, look a bit hard. I'll then. give you one right now if you want. <laughs> <laughs> I know the technique for getting one as oh, well. Oh, no, I don't fucking it's actually want one. It, it's, a, it's a punch and twist. Oh, mate, that's, no. Nice. It's a punch and twist, yeah. I've actually seen, I think, on Instagram... Uh, using a barbell and plates. Steve-O did that, didn't he? Yeah, Steve-O done that. Yeah. Yeah. Steve-o. But he didn't get it. Yeah. He didn't get it. Did yeah, because it's the pu- it's the punch punch and twist. Fuck. That's God. the way they do it. Okay. <laughs> Imagine that. I'm like, yeah, go on, do it. Fuck <laughs> yeah. Well, mate, you're not going to get one wrestling, are you? Let's no, be honest, because you pull no. guard no. all the time. <laughs> yeah. That's a bit sensible, mate. Yeah. Old age, you know? Yeah. yeah. Now, there's a big genetic component to cauliflower is. You, you get you get these poor white belts who've been training for three months, got massive Man, cauliflower. Like, <laughs> yeah. but you can't you can't quit jujitsu now because uh, you know you've got to you've got to get some skills to back up those ears. So. <laughs> yeah, just look. Like- but some people wear them like a badge of honor, though. So I think some people would probably hear what you've just said and say, "Absolutely not getting rid of my cauliflower ear." So each to their own. Each to their own. Yeah, yeah. I, don't, I don't really want to. Yeah, the issue that I've got, I've only got a mild one, but the issue that I've got is this year does this. Yeah. This year does that. Yeah. So it gets me stuck in, in some spots. Get massaging, man. I will, mate. I'm Get on it. Get massaging. <laughs> what do you do with the barbers? Because barbers always like that to me. <laughs> We'd be like, fuck it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know? I think he's just used to it, mate. It's fine. Yeah, yeah. But mate, it was a great seminar yesterday, though. Thank you very much. I appreciate it was, that. Uh, yeah, yeah, brilliant. And like, I've attended several seminars, many seminars over the years, and the content's always good, but not just the content yesterday, but the structure and mm-hmm. then the coaching which you delivered it was really good. I appreciate that. Thank you. Yeah. How have you, uh, how have you kind of found uh, that the, the concepts have been received since you've been kind of on this tour? Um, the, the Mount stuff yesterday yeah. specifically. Uh, the Mount is the most recent seminar um, that I designed. I have like quite a structured way that I uh, design and deliver seminars. And I've done it for a long time. Um, which was that I would back in the back in the day you would just book a person for a seminar. You do a Dan Strauss seminar and the person rocks up and they teach. Maybe they have something that they're planning to teach, maybe they don't. But very often they would just show sort of their like four, five, six favorite techniques. And um it's not good. <laughs> it's just not a good way to do it. It really isn't. Um it's it's hard to really learn stuff. Um, and when you're teaching five completely separate positions, I've been to some seminars with some really, really fantastic grapplers, uh, you know, elite world, le- you know, champions. And um, 
I was like, yeah, that was great. Don't remember a single fucking thing that was taught though, <laughs> because you know it's a it's a one take down, a guard pull, a reversal, uh, and a leg lock. You know, and you're just like, okay, straight over your head. So I um, started designing, like being very thoughtful in what I was going to deliver. First one was a guillotine seminar, obviously, because that's sort of the signature thing that I was known for. And I spent at the time I was teaching at Mill Hill, so I spent a couple of months sort of working out exactly how it would go, tra teaching it on my students to sort of uh, troubleshoot it a little bit. And then by the end of that, you have a you have a product. And, and because you have a product, you know exactly what you're going to be delivering. One, it's much more prepared and it feels like when you go and teach it, it feels prepared. It doesn't feel like you're making shit up on the spot. Um, but more importantly, because it's the same thing, one, it gets honed over time. And two, people know exactly what they're getting. I mean, it may change a little bit, but if you would, if you did a guillotine seminar with me five years ago, you do one tomorrow, it will be almost exa exactly the same. You know, it's it's very very similar. Um, so people know exactly what they're getting. It just means that you can. I kind of look at it in the same way that maybe a comedian would do a set or something like that, or routine, um, where you come up with your best material, you practice it, you hone it, and then you can just deliver it. Um, so I've done that with six different seminars the mount is the most recent um and i don't know whether it's recency bias but it's it's the one that i'm enjoying doing the most at the moment um it's i would probably say the one that people are telling me they are having the quickest transition from learning it to being able to apply and sparring very I was about it last very night, very I was quick some of those little details will help yeah. massively yeah like there's a few things that you you know for example the head redirection stuff from mount for controlling the mount position like you'll be able to use that if you did it an hour afterwards like you could have just sparred off the session you'd be able to make it work um obviously if you're doing it on someone who wasn't at the seminar it's going to be even more effective uh the other stuff usually takes a little bit longer but i have guys messaging me days or a week after a seminar saying I'm, I'm hitting this S mount armbar stuff on everyone I'm rolling with. So that's sort of the best thing that you can hope for as a instructor teaching seminars. And uh, with this mount one, uh, I get that with most of them, but I'd say that with the mount one, maybe more than any other that I've done. Yeah. Yeah, I think the structure really, it really shows, mate. Like even just down to the timing, she fucking mm. nailed the yeah, timing. I was about to say, yeah. Like, it was like, to the minute, it was incredible. That that's that I find the hardest. <laughs> yeah, 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 you did well, mate. And I think sometimes I guess the engagement from the audience and the, the questions might store you a little bit. Yeah. But I think, you know, some of the stuff that you showed, you know, sort of, again, you talked about the sort of the, the varying levels of so like the concept, which you could tell somebody and you go further mm. into the detail. Certainly from a conceptual point of view, I've, I've come across previously, but the level of detail that you went into, mm. And certainly with the redirection stuff, some of the other tools that you use in, in order to do that mm. was, was not something that I thought about. Mm. Um, and even, you know, the, the bit we did from the uh, sort of uh, quarter mount position, like I've, I've done that previously, but with the cross face and just switching to, to what we did. Mm. I was squealing, I think, when he did yeah. it. Just like, <laughs> off my legs. Yeah, he, <laughs> when you said it's on owner and then the spine alignment, yeah. as soon as I went like that, he was like, boom. Yeah. <laughs> The, I, I, that, uh, the guy that I did it on yesterday was actually pretty mobile through the spine, so it wasn't too bad. But very often when I show that the first time they don't know what's coming, they will uh, yeah. Yeah, they'll make a yeah. good noise there. It looks very dramatic. It's great, 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 great for teaching. Yeah, uh, it's, yeah. it's almost one of those positions that it, there's a few like this in jiu-jitsu where you, 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 you get to a point where you encourage the, them to just pass guard because you just like, just get off me and do what you want because it's so uncomfortable. Yeah, that's exactly it. And that that is, you know, there's different types of ways of playing the top game and the bottom game, but especially the top game. And uh, that is sort of the reaction that you want. You know, when, when, when I say that from the mount position, especially like you should be breaking your opponent mentally and emotionally, you know, that's not a joke. It sounds funny, but like you actually should. The psychology, it's a, it's a really underrated thing in grappling, but psychology is absolutely massive for, for, for the um, progression of, 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 of live grappling and understanding how people and, and, and kind of using psychology for your advantage. And there's loads of ways that you can do that. And, and one of them is really just taking your time, especially in positions like the mount. That, I mean, the mount is the quintessential pressure position. I mean, we call side control it's called 100 kilo position seven kilo um occasionally but no it's the mount position really where the pressure is coming so uh traditionally especially in nogi where the mount is used 
as a much looser position, you use it to go into a combat base mount and look to sort of gift wrap and take the back most of the time. That's what I used to always do. Um, but when you work out how to actually start pressuring from there, it's a, one, it's a really strong position, but two, you break them mentally and, and you, you, you get them into a mindset where they want out. And that's it. If you, if you get someone and they, that, that thought just needs to flick across someone's mind for a second. And that could be it, especially if you're in a, in, 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 in a actual competition. Yeah, it stuck in my head what you said last night. Like I'm exactly the same. Where I was always, I always try and attack from side control rather than mount. I'd rather not be a mount before, you know. So it's it for me. It was it was, yeah. It's what I needed to to be able to think right. I'm going to work on this now because before I would, I'd I'd get mount and then I'd be like, I don't really want to be here, and then I'd go back to side control and then start working their arms up and trying to get dices and whatever else but because i always felt it's like an unstable position and then i would lose the position then i'd have to go get it then, then being then being quarter guard and then back in fucking how long guard. you been training for uh 20 months okay i've been training for almost 20 years and up until a couple of years ago i was exactly the same yeah, yeah. you know up until i'd say 16 17 years into my training and i still really don't feel comfortable no gear mount yeah. Um. Un until I started, you know, like we said it's over different the last in the gear, isn't it? Because you've got grips, you got, you know, you can you can stay yeah. there. But in no gear, I always, I always feel unstable, especially if they're bigger. Mm -hmm. Obviously, if they're like a hundred kilo bloke and they got power, mm. I'm saying, oh, fuck, like him, he's fucking nightmare because he just fucking explodes with I mean, it. I so mean, it's like, eight kilos, man. No, <laughs> no, <laughs> no <laughs> <you are. laughs> but you know what I mean. Like he just fucking explode, and I'm like, oh, for fuck's sake, got to yeah. start from start again. Mm. Mm. Do you think some of that? Um, sort of mount positioning and, and mount play comes from your lineage for being sort of under Nick and who was under Hodger? Well, <laughs> on paper, you would think so, but I never really had much tuition under Roger. Um, Roger, you know, really my lineage through Roger came through Nick. Nick never played top game. Nick was a guard player through and through. Um, completely sort of opposing stylistically to Roger. My man. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's all I have. Uh, yeah, he was a guard player. He was slow and methodical. Um, but... Uh, you know, I, 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 I didn't even start looking at the mount position at all up until, up until Nick had already passed, to be honest with you. So uh, I think uh, uh, the, maybe if anything, it's what Nick did very well. And I remember this from very, very early on is he was incredibly patient. He was this slow, it, it was called the, you know, his nickname was the sloth and uh, <laughs> sloth jitsu is this thing. And, uh, and, and he, he had this patience that I've never witnessed from anyone else. And I mean, I remember when I first started, because I for a long time, it was just me and Nick trained together. He was, you know, pretty much my only training partner uh, when I was a kid and he used to just beat the shit out of me. And as I started to get better um, and I would really go for it with him and he would just defend for 10, 15 minutes, you know, no rounds. We just go. And, uh, and I would be just throwing every single attack. I'm, you know, 16, 17, 18 years old and I'm just attacking with reckless abandon. And, uh, until I start getting tired. <laughs> and then as soon as I start the slow, it's like, uh, he awakens from his shell <laughs> and then I'm in trouble. And then I'm in trouble for a long time. Um, yeah, and then he used to just beat the crap out of me. But yeah, incredible patience, incredible patience. Yeah. Mm. And that was obviously something you talked about, about mm. yesterday as well. So um, yeah, you can kind of see that still just in, mm. in obviously different positions. And I think what you did really well yesterday in the seminar as well is just your kind of ability to explain things in a, in a, in a really sort of easy to understand way. Mm. And I've just started coaching a little bit again. And you know, I'm always trying to think, and I've done sort of, you know, fitness and movement coaching and that sort of thing. So I'm used to working and coaching movement and people, but I don't know, I guess I'm looking for a little bit of advice from mm. somebody who's clearly very good at coaching from a jiu-jitsu perspective on, on what you think makes a really good coach and how people best learn jiu-jitsu. Uh, thank you very much uh, to begin with for the kind words. Um, it's it's an interesting question. I mean, a lot of people are kind enough to, to, to pay me similar compliments. And the first thing that I say, like, I've been coaching for a really long time. Um, I've been teaching jiu-jitsu for 16 years, um, at 17 years probably actually at this point. And um, so, so it's a long time. And I teach, I teach a lot of seminars. And you do teach differently when you're teaching seminars than when you teach classes because you don't have the rapport with the people already. So um, I would say that, you get even more, you get a lot more experience, maybe like months worth of experience in teaching from doing one seminar compared to, you know, would be months of teaching regular, regular people that you're working on a, on a day to day basis. Um, off the top of my head, a few tips for coaching is one, 
the only thing that matters is the is 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 developing the skills of the person that you're working with. Um, I think we have a propensity, especially early on when we start coaching, is and this is a natural thing. I have no doubt that I was the same early on, um, which is with the ego gets involved and you want to show how smart you are or how good you are or how great your techniques are and all of that stuff. And after a while, you start, you actually need to realize that that's not what it's about at all. The only thing that matters is is the person being able to pick it up, follow along, and are they be, being able to, to to apply the principles or techniques or whatever that you're teaching. Um, so going it from that perspective, I don't think that there's any tips that can um, – that can make up for what you would call mat time or teaching time, experience time, but just always being self-aware and self-critical and always trying to improve. I'd say that's probably like the main quality that I have or try to have that helps me and stuff like that, which is just, you don't, I'm not teaching the same way today that I was teaching five years ago, because if you are, something's gone wrong, you know, you're not improving at all. At all. You're always trying to develop and get better at that sort of stuff. So experience, um, try to work out what is working for the students and, and sort of hone that and always be, you know, keep that feedback loop, loop of what's working and what's not. Brilliant. Thank you for that, mate. Um, I watched a couple of podcasts recently just uh, to kind of get a bit of an understanding, I guess, about what you've been up to more recently and obviously you've been touring for a bit you've been traveling quite a bit and i think i heard you mention a couple of times that you kind of really missed having a team and, and you were looking at mm. open the gym where are you up with that currently oh jesus uh yeah that is uh nothing exciting unfortunately uh i've been looking for a gym so i taught i started teaching jiu-jitsu when i was 16 and uh i taught for 12 years up until uh the end of 2019 taught at mill hill for the last five of those years, I had my own full Nogi program. So I was, um, I had my own team and it was, it was awesome. Uh, I left teaching in Mill Hill in 2019 because I didn't feel like I had any growth there. I didn't want to just leave the gym open my own place and take half the students because I felt like that was not a cool thing to do. So my plan was to um, take a, a year or two to myself to go and travel, train, compete, and step back a little bit, return afterwards, and then open my own gym. Five, six months later, later COVID happens. Oh, <laughs> there's no traveling, there's no training, there's no competing. And by the time that everything started to open up again in sort of mid-21, I was already very much over the idea. I didn't, I didn't want to travel and do all of that stuff anymore. I just wanted to get a gym and I wanted to, to build that and, and get my team back. And since, uh, so for the last three years, I've been looking. And uh, it's... I've been looking pretty much constantly, um, sometimes when I've been less busy, more aggressively than others. Um, but so far, so far, no good. Uh, ma mainly issues in finding a place. And when you find a place, finding a, a, having the right usage class, that's been the issue. I've lost two gyms and possibly a third that I'm waiting to hear back on at the moment with change of usage planning permission. So... I'm still waiting. I'm still working on it. And hopefully, I've said this every year for the last three years, but hopefully this year, by the end of the year, I'll have a gym. <laughs> Fuck knows. Maybe I'll have the same conversation next year. But um, there's like, a, was it last year? Last year, I didn't really do anything all year because I was just focusing on 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 getting a gym. And it got to sort of late autumn last year and I had an epiphany, which is, I'm like putting all my eggs in a basket of stuff that is kind of out of my control. Like I can't magic a gym. Like I can't do it. I can just, I can, I can go, I can view places. I can put in offers. I can tr apply for planning, but I can't magic a place. Um, so I was like, okay, well, I'm just going to have to crack on with other stuff. Um, so I kind of got more busy with other projects, started taking, doing the writing of the book a bit more seriously. Um, and that's still, that's, that's still the goal. Um, yeah. I mean, a lot of people say, why the fuck do you want to open a gym? It's a massive pain in the ass. You can do loads of other stuff that's way easier. Um, but I don't want to open a gym as like a business decision, really, even though obviously that will it will be the main source of income. Um, I want it because that's actually what I want. Like I say, like, if you gave me a billion pounds today, I'd open a gym. <laughs> I, wouldn't, I wouldn't go and buy a house in Bali or something like that. I would spend it to open a gym. And with a billion pounds, I reckon I could grease some hands at the council and get that planning permission through. Yeah, I think you definitely <laughs> fucking could, right? 
<laughs> no, fair play, mate. And is that is that going to be in London or you? It'll be in North London or South or or, or Hertfordshire. Yeah. yeah. Okay, mate. Well, fingers crossed that you get some figured out, mate. I appreciate that. <laughs> <laughs> I hope so too. Yeah. I hope you have having this conversation it's with you in another year. Isn't it? It's a bit it of a nightmare, a but, nightmare, but you know what? These things happen. Every <laughs> people keep telling me. Um, uh, if you didn't get it, it's, you know, it's, it's meant to be or not meant to be. I'm like, uh, or it will happen when it happens. I go, I really wish that it should have happened <laughs> three years ago though. Always, it is. always read the fine prints as well, man. Yeah. I've, I've been stung a couple of times oh, on no, leases I know, I know, and stuff, know. you know yeah, what I mean? It's, yeah. it's savage out there. If they, they repurpose it and it's not quite right as well, they, they fucking, they can get it. Oh yeah, you. I've spent plenty of, uh, plenty of thousands of pounds on uh, solicitors looking over contracts. It's crazy, never, isn't it? And they, they always never sneak something in. Anything. Yeah, they always yeah. sneak something in as well, honestly. When you, when you like, you like agree everything in like verbally, they send through the contracts, send it to your solicitor, you know, cost you 300 quid. They look through the guard. Did you, did you say this? No. Go back. Oh yeah, that's got to be in there. Well, no, that's not, that's not what we agreed. And then the, they just sneak it in though, don't they? Yeah. Yeah. Landlords can be a bit of a pain in the ass, but is what it is. All right. Well, good luck. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. <laughs> appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, so where are we now? So we're into May. Um, this will probably go out or be out probably the end of May, early June. Uh -huh. Obviously ADCC is around the corner. August. Yeah. Is it August this year? I think so. So early this year. Yeah, I think so. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Um, I don't know if you've had a look at the sort of the lineups and, and the athletes. Not really. No. <laughs> I was going to ask for some predictions. Probably best not. No. <laughs> <laughs> do, you have, do you have the lineup there? I do. Yeah, go oh, on. Screw it. That's why he's bringing his laptop. Go on, throw it, throw it at me. Throw it at me. I love this. All right. The, the, the divisions are pretty much full, so I'm going to slide my laptop over to you. Oh, mate. okay. Uh, okay, under 66. Uh, good lineup. Oh, God, this is going to make for terrible TV. Uh, <laughs> I hope we see Owen do well. Um, that's the most important thing. And uh, who won last year? Who won 66 last year? It's Diego Hayes, wasn't it? Yeah. Uh, fuck knows, nice, mate. This is going to be, you probably want to cut all of this. No idea for 66. Uh, 77. <laughs> no idea. <laughs> <laughs> no, they're really tough to be like, you know, ADC. I know, mate, they're stacked, aren't they? AD, they're, they're so odd. They're stacked divisions, you know, they are stacked God, you divisions. Got, you got to make, you got to make a choice. I actually have to make a choice. Make a choice. Um, I'm going to go for, okay, 66 for Brizio Andre. Just because he's 66, by the way. How is he 66? Yeah, hell. I was just thinking that. I want to see this guy in real life. Like, Who do you just, think has stronger arms, you or for Brizio Andre? <laughs> <laughs> he definitely got better looking arms than me. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. That's, yeah, I don't know how he makes 77, that line, 66. Uh, 77, uh, super stacked division. Uh, probably go with Cade, maybe Mika. I mean, it's stacked. PJ, Dante, JT's in there, Nicky Ryan, Joseph Chen, Lanaka. I mean, Tackett. Yeah, that's that's anyone's game. 88. Uh, uh, that's a that's an interesting division. Maybe Ty. I mean, th those brothers are just something else, but it'll be interesting to see Taylor take on those guys. He looks so good at trolls. Uh, Jacob, J Rod. Interesting division, ATA actually. That they, they've got they've got a lot of space in ATA, don't they? That's not as uh, they've still got a few, quite a few invites to put out. Yeah. Uh, under ninety. Hmm. Kynan, probably. Am I just saying the winners of last year of the last event on every single one? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Jesus Christ. Uh, plus 99. Uh, Nicky Rodriguez. Gordon, is Gordon not competing anymore? Super fight. Oh, is he just in super? Who's, who's he against? Uh, Yuri. Okay. But that was going to be my next prediction is whether Gordon is going to be well enough and big enough to compete in the super fight. It doesn't seem like he is right now, right? Uh, obviously well let's quickly go through this because if I don't put the women there's going to be outrage Fion for f under 55 uh, mm, 60 oh we this is a new we have new divisions don't we yeah. so we have under 65 uh, I'm going to go with Amanda because I like Amanda and plus 65 I mean there's only three in it at the moment um, 
No idea. But it's going to be great to see Nier in it. That's that's wicked. And I think they have a absolute division this year they just announced, which is pretty cool. Women's absolute. Which makes you wonder, are we going to have a women's super fight next year? Mm. Absolute, it'll, it'll be first one, so I don't know how they do it. But winner of the women's absolute division, or do you do, you wait another year and then you get this year's winner against 2026's winner um, in 28. <laughs> that sounds like it's a long way away though. Uh, in terms of super fight and Gordon, who knows? He doesn't, he's he, from, from, from what I hear, I mean, I don't follow it super close, but from what I hear he's, 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 he's not particularly well. Yeah. See his latest photos. You advertise him with Tim, Tim Horton now, mate? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you seen his latest photos? Yeah. yeah mate, it was cracking me up. His gayest cowboy fucking pictures I've ever seen. Oh, I've not seen those. Have you not seen no. it? Craig Jones said have that. Have you seen it? He's yeah, yeah. Me. He's Craig, me. Craig is fucking ruining him, isn't he? Yeah. Mate, oh God. Mate, it was the uh, it was the screenshot that I sent you. So he did that video recently where he was just talking about his his sort of weight loss and his, and his current strength levels and everything else. And and then towards the end, he was doing um, he was doing like a box opening of his GoPro or something. And it just ended up with him with his tash, not looking his best, mm. hair everywhere, GoPro on, just like. Yeah. And I'm like, wow. I yeah. don't know. He's a weird one though, isn't he? Because he's looked like that before. And then two months later, he's fucking jacked because he's on whatever he's on and he's just flying again. Like mm. how many times have we seen him look like shit and then go back to like looking like this fucking yeah, Hulk like, monster? But how often can you do it? That's you've, a problem, you've, got to, you've got to imagine that that is one of the reasons why yeah, 100%. It's, it, you know, he's having such a rough time because when you go like, okay, I'm not doing well, but I've got to go do ADCC and I've got to win because he has to. Because like, I mean, he's so on top that his brand is essentially about being unbeatable. And if he loses a single match, it's game over. He's in a, like, you know, it really is like for him, just because he, he's so, he's such a polarizing character where people are looking for the downfall. That's what, that's why you watch Gordon Ryan. Yeah, you don't watch is. Gordon Ryan to watch him win. You hope to watch him lose. And that, that is, and, and that's, you know, we, we, we've seen it so many times. We saw it with Conor McGregor. We saw it with Ronda Rousey. And when they do lose, they, you know, it's hard. And it's hard to come back from that. The brand completely like that changes. AJ as well in boxing. Everyone yeah. was like waiting for him to lose. When he got knocked out of Ruiz, yeah. even though I really like AJ at the time, I was like, I was fucking buzzing. I was like, what the fuck? How has he knocked him out? But You know what I mean? Yeah. And and yeah, the, the, there's these people who have this, the brand is sort of this aura of invincibility. And so it's, so it's tough for him. There's a lot of pressure there, huge amount of pressure. And, uh, and, and Gordon really could, he's got nothing left to prove. He could easily could he um, not just come down and wait, get off the, get off as much as he's on and then just come back, back down to like fucking his actual natural weight, which is probably about 90 kilos and just, mm. just be healthy and just smash everyone at 90 at his mm. regular weight instead of like, killing himself effectively to fucking you know be I don't think it's just the weight thing I think it's the strength thing I think it's the performance thing you know I think I think it's everything and uh yeah so so he goes back on gear in order to get big and strong and 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 to feel to feel you know to have that confidence again and in doing so it, it, it just compound it compounds the damage the next time yeah I think he's gonna I think he's gonna ruin his body if he carries on though like really really ruin his body even though he owes out it sounds pretty bad already and, and, and stomach issues are horrible and, and you know I'm, I'm not Gordon's biggest fan but at the same time you know I, I'm massive I respect everything he's accomplished in the sport and what he's done for the sport and more importantly like I wouldn't wish you know those chronic stomach issues on anyone and I've known a few people with, with really bad stomach issues one of the most terrifying things so I do wish him better but yeah We'll have to see. Yeah, we will. We'll have to see. Yeah. Um, May, I wanted to tell you about your podcast. Okay. Because I think you're the, possibly the first other podcaster we've spoken to, actually. Okay. You, you certainly, you know, the first podcast that's been going for a while. I think you've done 109 episodes. Sounds about right. Yeah. When did you start? About six years ago, right? <laughs> you probably know more than me. <laughs> Maybe <laughs> somewhere, a little, somewhere a little while no, ago. Probably longer than that, actually. Probably quite a bit longer than that because, I mean, you have to remember that COVID was four years ago. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, probably seven or eight years ago, maybe more. So you were quite an early adopter because this is obviously, uh, you know, we jumped on the bandwagon, so to speak. I wasn't the first UK, uh, jujitsu podcast. Um, but I was one of the first mm. and it was before everyone started doing podcasts. Yeah. And when I say everyone does podcasts, not like this, this is a super, super nice setup. I was saying earlier, uh, you guys are doing this really well. Thank you. What was the inspiration for your podcast originally? Um, I got a dog 
which is an interesting start. I got a dog and I was doing a lot of seminar. To- I was I was touring doing seminars. So a lot of dog walking, a lot of driving. And I was getting very bored of listening to the same music over and over again. So I started listening to podcasts. And um, as I'm listening to them, I'm thinking, I really wish there was a jujitsu. You know, I just had in my head, I, w- I wish there was like something that was a little bit more, you know, for me. <clears throat> and then, um, And then someone approached me to do a podcast. Um, and I got really excited about it and we recorded it a little bit. It was not what I had in mind. Um, and as soon as we wrapped on that, um, I went home and bought two microphones and about a week later recorded the first episode. Simple as that. Okay. And this next question might bomb as much as the ADCC predictions. Yeah, you can just cut that whole thing out. <laughs> <laughs> Cause people ask us this next question and I struggle to answer it myself, but over your 109 episodes, who was your favorite conversation? Uh, I've had a lot of really enjoyable conversations. The, the ones that kind of come to mind off the bat are uh, Mauricio Gomez. Um, Mar- Mauricio is one of my favorite people in the world. Um, incredibly humble guy. I was, he's the, when I started the podcast, he was the number one person on the list that I wanted to get. Because at the time, he's a lot more well known now. Uh, since he moved to the UK and, you know, and, 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 you know, he's, he, he is a lot more, uh, sort of mainstream in the jiu-jitsu world. But at the time I, I knew, I've known Mauricio, I met Mauricio back in like 2007 or eight. So I've known him for a really long time. And, uh, I felt like he was, he's a massive player. He is the godfather of UK jiu-jitsu. We say all the time, you know, if it wasn't for him, we probably wouldn't be having this conversation. Jiu-Jitsu would be further behind than it is now. And um, he is an integral part of the story of Jiu-Jitsu from the very early days in Brazil and with the Gracie family. And obviously, he also happens to be the father of the greatest grappler that's ever been born. Um, And uh, so I really, really wanted to get Mauricio on. I was like, Mauricio, can we come on my podcast? He was like, nah, not (laughs) not interested. No one wants to hear me talk. And I was like, oh, I feel like they do, Mauricio. Uh, So when we finally got to do that, it was like super enjoyable. And um, and yeah, that was that was a great chat. Uh, Obviously, like the Simon Hayes one, I think that was like episode three or four. It was super early. It was the first person that I spoke to who was outside of like my immediate circle. First couple of people I spoke, I spoke to my like one of my best mates, my strength and conditioning coach, and I spent spoke to my coaches, and then I spoke to Simon, who I I knew, but was just outside of my very immediate circle, and 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 it was just a, you know, it was like a legendary episode that everyone talks about all the time. The Simon Hayes episode. Uh, Dan Hardy, I really, really enjoyed my conversation with Dan Hardy, just because uh, I'm, I just, I'm a big fan of his, and and you it's know, great character, isn't it? great character, and we just got on really well and had a great, you know, I've, I've worked with Dan, I like Dan a lot, um, and the conversation, I mean, I had to shoot off, but I think it was like four hours. I think it's the longest episode we did. <laughs> we we could have gone hours. longer, yeah, easily. Really, um, but there's a lot of the other episodes I like. Those are episodes where I go. They were great and I knew they would be. The really cool episodes are the ones that are great that you didn't expect. And uh, a really a good example is the John Hegan episode. Um, one of his students reached out to me saying, you know, my coach is kind of gave me, gave me the spiel on who his coach was. I hadn't heard of him before. Old school guy. Um, and I thought, fuck it, let's, let's give it a go. And I had him on. And he was fantastic. He was great. He was awesome on the podcast. Uh, he had great stories. Uh, old school, worked in prisons, real practical <laughs> yeah, application real of jiu-jitsu, class. you know, really, really cool. Um, and uh, yeah, a load like that. Uh, a load of the army guys that always have really interesting stories. Um, I had I had one guy on, ex-army guy. It was one of the few completely non-jiu-jitsu related, and we were talking about non-jiu-jitsu related episodes. Um, he was an explorer basically the, him and his mate were both ex army and uh, they were walking across or you know crossing the five largest islands in the world a guy called Ant Lambert is who I spoke to and just had this incredible story and I was just absolutely engrossed in it the entire time super you know like the the the, the coolest stories are just people going and doing crazy shit right yeah, yeah <laughs> and, I was like I recently with Joe Rogan when we met yeah. you in the Amazon yeah he like yeah. he lives in the Amazon and he just fucking he, I was honestly it was like three hours and I was just in you know what I mean I just, you just live vicariously I and like, I watch another podcast yeah. of his and just you like, don't have yeah. the balls to do it yourself so nah, you listen to other people on podcasts talk <laughs> it's about it it's fucking crazy um, yeah I've done a lot of episodes I've enjoyed 
almost all of them and uh, some more than others, but it's it's been a privilege. I mean, uh, the, the whole reason I did the podcast was just like I do with everything. I think this is an important thing when people are creating things. Mm. Um, never create what you think people want. Only ever create what you want. It's a very important thing. Um, if you try and, and that can be um, with the podcast, that could be with a clothing brand, that could be with um, artists in other mediums. Never ever create what you think will sell. Never create what you think will be popular because you are being inauthentic to yourself and it will not it will resonate with some people it will not resonate with other people like everything but most importantly it won't resonate with you so my ethos with anything that i create whether it's the book whether it's a podcast whether it's anything else whether it's content on on instagram i just put out stuff that i enjoy that i would enjoy if i wasn't myself and therefore it doesn't matter if nobody likes it if you do like it then you you know then you like me you, you like the stuff that I'm creating naturally, you know, the stuff that's authentic. So the, for me, the podcast was exactly the same. Um, I didn't care if nobody listened. I did, never pandered to anyone's interests. All I wanted to do was talk to people that I was interested in talking to. And the couple of times where, for whatever reason, I skewed away from that and I thought, oh man, I haven't put an episode out in a while. I better get one out. Those are the ones that I look back on and go, probably shouldn't have done that. I was doing it for the wrong reasons. Mm -hmm. So um, that's why over the last four years, um, since I, I had a studio up until 2019 when I stopped teaching I, I left the studio as well because I was not going to be about and since then the podcast has been mobile and I've gone six, seven, eight, nine months without an episode I'm like yeah there's nobody I want to talk to I'm not going to I'm not going to force it it will happen when it happens I've, I've, the podcast is on complete hold at hiatus at the, at the moment until um, I was saying earlier until I get another studio again so I can make it nice and professional like this. And then when I do it, I'll go back to talking to people that I want to talk to. Yeah. No, it's an, it's an interesting one, isn't it? Because we we kind of commit to one a week. Mm. The stuff. Yeah. And we've certainly had episodes where we were like, oh, it's even worth putting out. But we have, and some of them have bombed. But equally, like like you said, some have actually surprised us and done very well. So, so yeah, I think it is sometimes worth just having those conversations. Mm. Is there was there ever a conversation that you had where just I don't know you just didn't get on with the person it was like fucking pulling teeth whether you released it or not where you really struggled I released every episode that I've recorded um, there's a couple there's a couple uh, if you're if you're on a I'll give you advice if you're ever a guest on a podcast don't give one word answers oh this is what we say that's, all the time <laughs> and, 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 and I've had them both I mean I remember the the um, the, the complete opposite of that actually was Mark Waldo. I did another one recently actually that was very similar to that, which was with Chris Crossan, which was really cool. Uh, crazy stories, you know, up up in the uh, up in the uh, the north uh, northeast, and uh, you know, it's just crazy street fighting stories and gangster stories and stuff <laughs> like that. And Mark Waldo was the same. Where I like started the podcast, asked a question. Mark was probably the best with this. And he just spoke for two and a half hours. <laughs> I, didn't say, I look at the wavelength of the recording afterwards. I'm like, I didn't say shit. It was amazing. Uh, so, so that's sort of the, what you want from a guest. Sometimes you've got to coax that out. Um, but if people are giving you short, super short answers, it can be a, a real slog sometimes. Yeah. Yeah. We've been quite lucky, mate. I think we've had a lot of, well, most of our, well, I'd say pretty much all of our guests have all been pretty good. All been pretty good talkers, you know. It's only only a few where we've had to like really like yeah coax out of them, but most people just most people like talking. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah, and I think the key thing as well is if you're speaking to somebody about a topic they're obviously passionate and and have a lot of knowledge around, mm. then it comes very easy. I think when you like with the ADCC predictions, <laughs> when you when you press them on maybe an area that they're not particularly interested in or haven't thought about, that's sometimes when you like a bit oh, it can get a bit sticky. Yeah, but yeah, no, it's cool, man. Um, let's talk about your book. Okay. Um, first, how's it been received? It's gone out just in the last week, I think, on the first. Yeah, released it? on the first. Yeah, um, it's been really good. It's so nice to get it out and done with. Um, it has been many magnitudes of pain in the arse above what I thought it would ever be. Um, it's been an absolute bane of my existence for about the last six or nine months. Really, really difficult. In what way? What, just getting it released or just actually no no, no it? that's easy oh, is it? yeah, <laughs> yeah just, releasing just... it has been uh the the the, the way that i did it very very easy um that was the easy part just getting it to that that stage 
Um, I mean, no, there's, there's been some bits with it. So like I wrote everything finally and had it all ready to go and then uploaded it and then realized that like the margins were out and all, all of these like things that you don't think about beforehand. So th those were a little bit of a pain in the ass, but that was just time consuming. It wasn't like cognitively draining. The cognitively draining stuff is you get 90 or 80% of it done quite easy. But that last 20, <laughs> 10, 5, 1%, that takes an incredible amount of effort. And you're just so bored of going over the same thing over and over again. And, and um, you, you, you know, just having to structure it in a certain way and like what's the best format and how it will work. Um, yeah, it, it's been a lot of work. It's been a lot. Of work. I've never tried to do anything, anything like this before. So um, it was very new to me. I was basically doing it completely by myself i had uh, a friend of mine who basically just kind of almost acted like a just like a a a, 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 an, a wall to just talk to essentially just to bounce some ideas off because i mean i got to a point where i had this little uh I had this little marble owl that I was talking to. I was kind of losing my mind a little bit because I couldn't like, I, I, I like couldn't read it to my own head. So I was doing stuff like I was talking to things to like, as if I was having conversations to things. Um, I, on multiple occasions used a, um, a, te a, a text to voice so I could listen to it being spoken yeah, to yeah, me. Yeah. So I wasn't just reading it over and over again. Uh, so it was a massive pain in the ass. <laughs> like towards the end of it, there were a few times where I was like, you know what, this isn't worth it. And I was going to sack it in. <laughs> just sack yeah, it Yeah, hundred percent, hundred percent. If my friend Lisa hadn't have helped me with it and like, no, you're close, keep going. Like if she wasn't helping me, I wouldn't have done it. hundred percent. I'm <laughs> convinced of that. So it's really, really nice to get it out there. Um, it is so far, it's been really well received, which is of course nice. But again, like to be honest with you, I didn't care. I really did. It's very nice when people appreciate anything that you do. Um, but if no, if, if 10 people bought this book, I'd be happy. And that's a gen, I mean, that sounds crazy. Um, th th there's sort of the amount of time that I put into it. There's almost, it would be impossible for me to attempt to recoup the equivalent amount of money. It's like, it's not about the money for sure. Um, and it's not even about selling lots of them, even though that's super nice to do. So if you're listening, go ahead and buy one. It'd be nice. Uh, however, it was just something that I felt like I had to do. It was something I, I really enjoy the process of creating things. Um, I have created some, you know, obviously I create content, short form content, which is just based on my training. I try to create some other educational stuff and helpful stuff and add value for people. Um, and the podcast is another form of creation, all of stuff like this. Um, I've, I've made some courses, which are also very nice to do, but I really like books. I really like books. Like I'm big into books. So the idea of putting the information into a physical book form was very appealing to me. So it just got to the stage where I wanted to create this regardless of whether anyone bought it, read it or what they thought of it. I just wanted to get it out of me. So to get it out was very, very good. And for obviously it's just a massive cherry on top for people to actually enjoy it. Mm. I'm, I'm looking forward to having a read through. I've not had the opportunity to do so yet. And I mentioned earlier, we'll, we'll chat about it in a second, but my hands and my elbows mm. are not in good nick. And please don't take this the wrong way. It's not meant as an offense in any way, but I was surprised when I met you yesterday how how small and, and nice your hands look. Thank you very much. I mean, I feel like the small was uh, an unnecessary <laughs> caveat there. It's, it's more of a reflection, not on you, but on other people we've met. So Sam yeah. and Frank, for an example, yeah. Bralio, when we met him, just these fucking massive like fisherman hands. We've said it a few times, haven't we? Like yeah. all these fuckers have got big hands. Yeah. And for you to have like regular sized hands, it's actually quite refreshing that there is hope. <laughs> so I assumed the, you know, arguably the number one jujitsu guy, certainly in the UK, known for grip strength yeah. and training. I assume we'd have these big monster hands yeah. and you haven't. I think what people need to understand about me is that I am not naturally physically gifted in any way. In any way. I mean, if you saw me back 15 years ago, I was a small, skinny kid. I never excelled in any sport, or in any athletic endeavor ever as a child up until I started jujitsu. Um, the idea of being strong for that reason was very appealing to me because I wasn't. I never had that naturally at all. And you just have to look at my calves to see that. And um, so everything that I've managed to do in... Um, in, especially in the in the strength world, the achievements that I've been able to do, even though you know not like winning world strongest man or anything, but um, all of the feats that I've been able to do have been 
against you know that 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 a bit of adversity there which is that it doesn't come naturally to me i don't have massive hands i don't have a naturally strong grip everything that i have i've had to work for um which i think gives me more of an insight and in how you can develop these things than some people who are just freaks who just have massive super strong hands you know have always been good at sport i wasn't like that at all i mean you, you know you'll see some pictures of me from back in the day like i'm not naturally a big strong guy i had to fucking eat a lot of food i've had to do a lot of training i've trained consistently for many years um in in order to get to where i am now mm. it's a lot more relatable as well when it's people yeah. when they see that if they if they've known you for a long time and they followed your journey mm. and then you've got these fucking this huge <laughs> grips and strength and you you do know those things because 90% of people are like that. 90% yeah. of people are not athletic, you know, are not gifted, not, you know, most people who are training hobbyists are just regular people training mm. twice a week, three times a week. So it's nice to see that you can transform and do that. Yeah. And obviously hand health in, in life, but, you know, certainly in jujitsu as well is extremely important. And as I just mentioned a moment ago, my hands uh, hurt mm. often when not even doing anything. Yeah. So what do you think the, the sort of key things to hand health is? is? Is it strength or? So what I'd say firstly is this, it's not just hand health that is an issue in jujitsu or in all sports, but especially in jujitsu. I had this idea. And, and again, this is, this is from experience because I've been like this in the past where we have a really bad attitude to injuries in jujitsu, really bad, really bad attitude where you wear them as a badge of honor a little bit and I did it, you know, oh, my back is broken. My knees are fucked. I've had shoulder surgeries. And you, you know, you, you, the, the idea of you go to the doctor, they tell you to take a couple of weeks off and you tape everything up and you go back to training. And that's all well and good until it really starts to catch up with you. And then you start to realize that um, you cannot, as said by the great strongman, George Hackenschmidt, um, health cannot be divorced from strength. This is a very, very important concept. It's when I, I have a whole massive section in the book about lower arm health. Health cannot be divorced from strength. If your body is dysfunctional with injury, you will not be able to function to your fullest. And yes, potentially that dysfunction can be caused by a huge amount of specific training, like the Mia brother's hands. They can't do anything else other than hold onto a gi, but they can hold onto a gi pretty well but they probably can't type or write or, and they're probably in pain a lot of the time. Um, so the question starts to be that, that that's the sacrifice you make as an elite athlete. You go, I can't, I, I need to sacrifice the short term performance benefits for long term health and, and longevity in the sport. If you are a professional athlete, then you can make that sacrifice and maybe, you know, you weigh that up and you go, okay, it's worth it. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll wreck myself. I'm not going to do too well in, in, my, in my late 30s and 40s and certainly after that, but I'll get some gold medals on the way and I'll make some money and it will be worth it. But if you're a hobbyist, that attitude is absolutely insane. It's completely crazy because when you're a hobbyist, even though of course you want to have the best performance that you can, because why would you be doing the sport otherwise? But you are doing it because you enjoy doing it. And if you enjoy doing it, you want to do it for a long time. So you have to prioritize a balance between health and performance. And that's not just the hands, but we'll talk about that more in a second. That's in the whole body. That's in your neck. That's in your back. That's in your shoulders. That's in your knees. That's in your elbows. That's everywhere. Um, be smart with your training. It's okay to miss a couple of days. It's okay to roll light. It's okay to put knee pads on if that means that you're going to be able to roll 10 years longer than you would otherwise. This is very important. Now, specifically talk, talking about hands and elbows. So that's just like a general like concept of, of, of uh, uh, finding this balance between health and performance and understanding that, that, that health, that, 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 that they're very closely linked. Uh, in terms of the hands and elbows, let's start with the hands. The main damage from hands in jiu-jitsu is um, the gi. That is, that is why my hands look good mm -hmm. because I train gi for like, 10, nine, 10 years and I stopped. I I'm, I'm put the gi on. I, I've probably trained in the gi 10 times since I got my black belt 10 years ago. And I've not, I've rolled in the gi once in the last five, six years. I don't train gi. Um, I have no intention of going back to gi um, and my fingers are happy for it. 
when I trained in the gear, I was already I was already quite into or I got into to strength training and grip training. And when you get into this, you value your hands. You don't want to fuck up your knuckles. You don't want to mess up your fingers. So um, one of the things, again, that I talk about in the book is how how can you grapple in the gi with with grip with a uh, grip health or hand health in mind and one way is how do you grip so if you're gripping i just grab onto my shorts here so i can show you if you're gripping with a pocket grip okay or a, a sleeve grip you know a standard grip that people grab onto a sleeve for if you're gripping like this you need to assume that you're going to lose your grip at some point that they're going to be stripped when you're in a pocket grip and it gets stripped your fingers are being ripped open dynamically, you know, against resistance. And that is going to do damage. Small, sometimes not so small, but cumulatively over the years, that's going to do a lot of damage. I always, even when I was training the gi, I always grab with a pistol grip. Because when you grab with a pistol grip, that grip gets removed, your hands never change shape. You're not getting that dynamic ripping open of the fingers. So again, some people might go, but my grip isn't as strong with the with with that. You know, I, I love playing Spider Guard. You know, I'm going to be weak in Spider Guard. You go, okay, well, you got to weigh it up a little bit. For me personally, I trained um, my grip strength. I, again, I don't have naturally good grip. So when I first started training Jiu Jitsu, I couldn't hold on to sleeve grips very strong at all. My fingers aren't weren't strong. My fingers aren't still aren't super strong because I don't I don't need to train my fingers because I don't do a lot of sleeve grip stuff. Um, but what I uh, the first big jumps in grip strength that I got came from doing stuff like farmer's walks. So you're working what I refer to as closed hand support. Closed hand support is the sort of position that you're using when you take pistol grips. So I developed the strength for pistol grips, which, mean, which meant that I had very good grip, even though I wasn't using a quote unquote optimal grip. But it meant that my fingers were never being battered. Um, so that that that's one of the big things. Uh, other things are just training your hands evenly so if you're doing loads of um uh, uh, flexion stuff through the fingers training extension stuff and other ranges of motion keeping mobility and just keeping them moving in other ways but the main thing is if, if, if your fingers are fucked from doing jiu-jitsu just start using pistol grips is the very short answer to it it make a big big difference elbows are a very very common one um it's a super easy fix the reason for not all but the reason that a majority of people have problems with their elbows when they train jiu-jitsu is that they are always gripping. They're always flexing, flexing, flexing. So you get very developed flexors and there essentially becomes an imbalance between the flexors and extensors. So in order, which manifests itself as that uh, medial epicondylitis, that, that, that inside elbow pain. And the way to combat that is to train the opposing muscle group. So to work your extensors. Because the problem is, is you go... You, you train jiu-jitsu, you grab onto lapel, you grab on the pistol grips, you grab on the sleeve grips, you're grabbing onto wrists, you're grabbing, grabbing, grabbing. And then you go to the gym, and what do you do? More grabbing, because you want to get stronger at doing those things. You wanna, you're want you holding onto barbells, and you're doing farmer's walks, and you're, you know, you're doing gi pull-ups and all of this stuff. And then, so, so you've already got an imbalance, you go to the gym and you, you exacerbate that imbalance. Instead, you can do that stuff but you've got to be training the extensors as well. So that can be wrist extension, wrist curls. That can be, I do some really nice banded stuff with it. Um, you know, finger band, banded finger openers, although I do prefer getting the wrist into extension the work there. And the, the beauty of it is the extensors are so much smaller and weaker than the flexors that a relatively very small amount of training can, can match that balance. So I have people who, um, have had elbow issues for years and they do some of the stuff that I recommend in the book, in my online course, or even on my Instagram, I talk about it all the time and their issues can be fixed very, very quickly. Even some, I mean, I put out a, um, I put out a post a few years back. I, I had my pec surgery and I, I couldn't train. I couldn't lift properly, but I just spent hours in my gym fucking around with stuff. And I developed this, um, what I call it an extensor row. So you put a band, a light band, attach it to the rack, put it around my knuckles, and then you go into wrist extension in order to hold it, and then you pull backwards. Because what I always found was, when if you were to do a wrist curl, you're gripping the dumbbell with the flexors and then going into extension. So yes, you're working extensors, but you're still working your flexors. Like how can we 
take away the flexors entirely and only work extensors. So um, my friend Sean invented this thing that he calls the iron claw, which is a boxing mitt that you can load weight on. So your hand is open and you can work extensor. It will hit it really well. But without having that, a really easy way to do it, band round the knuckle into wrist extension in order to hold it and then either holding back and, and just holding it there or doing rows, rows with it and I just felt it lit up my extensors massively and I put it on Instagram and I told people that they're having elbow problems give it a go do three sets of 15 every day or every other day for a couple of weeks and hopefully it will go I don't have elbow issues so I don't know I can't test it people message me that they have had elbow issues for months they went to their shed they did one set of 15 gone like that imagine if yours went like that <laughs> and, and, and when people go well that's impossible how can something how can you like balance well because that in that case it's not the musculature it's not the size or strength of the muscle it's just the tone of the muscle so just by hitting that for one set the tone of the muscle increases and it takes that pressure off the elbow you do it a little bit more you work up more musculature in the outside of the fore in in the extensor and that pain goes yeah no it's interesting man. i'll give it a go for sure i had one of your guys at the gym yesterday who said that he had terrible terrible um he spoke to me yesterday after the seminar he texted me again this morning saying things and he said that he had the guy who looks like jason Momoa. oh you know yeah what I'm saying? yeah uh, there's only one guy in your gym who looks like jason <laughs> Momoa, <so. laughs> and uh, he said that he had some terrible um elbow problems and tendon problems and he got my online course and, and he said it, it fixed him I'm like, that, that, that is the best that that is the best thing that I can hear from someone. Not that they got stronger or that they choked someone out, but that they had a an ailment or an injury that they fixed from my stuff. It doesn't get better than that. Yeah, and the type of contraction that you look at, obviously that particular exercise is, is quite isometric, I guess, isn't it? Because you're not really moving, you're kind of holding that position. Mm -hmm. And I know there's been studies, certainly in the knee, I think, where isometric exercise have shown to to reduce pain. Mm -hmm. So so I think that alone can work. Mm. Do you tend to, to focus more on isometric or do you work on eccentrics? What do you find for, best? Um, specifically for working the forearm extensors or in general? The extensors. Okay, so for extensors, um, the answer is just because of sort of what I was talking about in terms of not having to hold something as you go into wrist extension. So you can do wrist curls, but you're working the flexors slightly as well. So it's very difficult with a band, for example, to do concentric and eccentric, right? So I just go into isometric and you're hitting it straight away. In that instance, if I was using the iron claw where it's strapped onto me, then I would be doing, I wouldn't just be holding it, I would actually be doing, I was working it a couple of days ago, I was in my garage, I wanted to hit the extensors and I've got the, the, the those boxing mitts on with the, with the weights and doing uh, the full movement. So it doesn't really matter in my opinion, as long as you're hitting those muscles, you're developing those muscles, you're finding that balance in the forearm. Yeah. Yeah, cool. You touched on something yesterday yeah. with the armbar finish. Um, I forget what you called it, but it was essentially talking about holding the thumb because you lose sort of almost like defensive energy through that weaker joint of the wrist. Not the thumb, but the hand. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, so this is this is the idea that one of the one of the things that has always fascinated me about jujitsu. I think one of the reasons why I took to it so much and why I still find so much fascination in it is the deep connection between effective grappling and human anatomy and physiology. And it's just something, anatomy is some, and physiology is something that's always fascinated me, how the body moves, how the body works. And in jiu-jitsu, if you know how the body, you don't have to know, but if you do know, you can find novel ways of making it stronger and you can find novel ways of making it weaker. And that's the whole point, right? Like what is jiu-jitsu about making you strong and making them weak? So that concept, is the idea that when energy travels through a joint, um, some of that energy is lost as it stabilizes the joint. The more unstable or mobile the joint is, the more energy is lost when it passes through it. So for example, if I was to grab onto my wrist and bicep curl, the energy from the bicep would travel through the bicep into the elbow. The elbow is like a very simple hinge joint it's a pretty strong joint it's not super mobile so most of the energy will continue through the elbow doesn't lose much energy through the forearm and then into where i'm grabbing and that's where there's going to be resistance now when i go on the other side of my wrist and i grab onto my hand that same energy from the bicep goes through the elbow up through the forearm and then with the wrist that is much more unstable much more mobile 
a lot more energy is needed to stabilize that wrist and a much smaller fraction of that energy that was originally generated is expressed through the hand. So by grabbing on, and, and you could easily say that this is just end of lever control and you would be right. <laughs> like from that's physics the end of the lever is going to be weaker but you're not appreciating the full mechanics of how it's working because if my if my wrist was let's say my wrist was fused i have no joint in my wrist then the effect that you're going to feel on the end of the lever is going to feel very different than when that that wrist has that mobility through it so this is true when you are controlling the hand from the back when you're grabbing onto the hand to, to attack the arm bar this is grabbing onto the foot instead of grabbing onto the shin when you try and control the leg you can start to see this from from many different applications but it's a fantastic example for me of using using anatomy to try and make jiu-jitsu more effective yeah, no, it was it was fascinating when you said. Um, I think it was one of those things that I had to put a smile on my face because it mm. kind of I've I've done a degree which involved a lot of anatomy, and suddenly it was oh yeah, of course, mm. makes perfect sense. Yeah, um, and I guess just thinking about that principle and, and almost backwards engineering the sort of strength of your of your hands. You know, do you put as much weight into strengthening you know sort of the kinetic chain all the way up through the shoulder and everything else? Yeah, that's a really good question, and and. Yeah, 100%. So, uh, I mean, you've got to look at strengthen the weakest links. Right? You know, it's the, the classic saying, right? You're only as strong as your weakest link. So when it comes to your hands, the weakest link is usually the wrist. And it's why I preach so heavily about wrist training. Um, the majority of the uh, training that I do is wrist training. And the wrist has many, because of how mobile it is, it has many articulations. So we have flexion and extension, we have ulnar and radial deviation, and then supination and pronation, which is technically from the elbow, but it's still movement through the wrist. Uh, but especially the de uh, flexion, extension, and deviation, all of these ranges of motion are um, can be capitalized on f by your opponent when you're grappling. So for example, if you grab onto my wrist, you grab onto my wrist here. If I was to strip your grip, so stay nice and strong there for me. If I was to try and strip the grip like this, I grab onto here and I pull out like, like this, here, like this. So I just go and slow it. Okay. Uh, if I do this, what it looks like is that I'm pulling out from the fingers, but I'm not. What is ap actually happening is as I hold here, stay strong. As I hold here and your wrist is forced into flexion, now it's weak and then I can remove it. So if you grab on, if I just do it quickly here, like that, you never see it, but that's what's actually happening is you're going into flexion. So another uh, a little demonstration that you can make, we can all do this right now, if you're watching, you can do this, like take, take your hand, grab, grab on the two fingers and just squeeze them as hard as you can, okay? Then let go, bring your wrist to 90 degrees and squeeze those fingers as hard as you can. You feel like a, a child holding onto it, right? <laughs> so it just goes to show you how much strength is lost when the wrist is put in deflection, which is one, you can use that to your advantage by forcing the wrist in deflection in order to weaken it and remove and strip grips and stuff like that. But it also means that if I can make my wrist, one, less likely to go into flexion, and two, stronger in flexion, then I can reinforce the strength that would usually be in a weaker position, I can make it less weak. So I, I, I talk about this, there's a quite a novel idea that I sort of came up with on my own. I'm not sure if anyone's doing it. Um, and I, I was, I'm in an R in about including it in the book, but I, I ended up doing so, which is moving support, but more importantly, moving crush. So I'll take a very light and, and, and it doesn't have to be um, a gripper, but I'll take a very light gripper. Um, I know I've spoken to people and they've done it with a tennis ball. Technically, you could even just do it by balling your fist up. But I take a very light gripper and then I move into flexion, move into extension, move into deviation in both directions. And I start to train my ability to generate force in those compromised positions because that is going to strengthen up that link. And, uh, and, and, and over time, that's going to that's gonna have an effect on the mat. How much has that affected your jiu-jitsu? Has it helped that much? That's the honest truth. Like um, look, it's a very hard question to answer. You know, how much you can't having a strong grip doesn't make you better at jujitsu. No, but does it help? Yeah, of course. Yeah, of course. I mean, there, there have been times, I mean, look, strength is never a weakness. Simple as that. Strength is never a weakness. There is no scenario. You, it, you can be so strong that your jujitsu becomes shit. 
but this, that's not strength's fault. That's your fault, right? <laughs> that's, that strength's made you an idiot. Strength is never a weakness in itself. Um, it almost can't be by definition. Um, but yes, it's 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 obviously it's made a massive difference yeah. in my grip. And I wouldn't have made it such a big part of it. Um, I mean, obviously, I'm interested in, in in grip sort of outside the context of grappling, but it's always with the primary focus on 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 being strong for grappling. There have been occasions where I've done specific things that have had a super notable noticeable effect on the mat. I, I, I tell the story of um, I got this implement uh, from David Horn called the Wrist Developer, right? And does what it says on the tin, and it is a super weird looking contraption that is designed for practicing for nail bending. Okay, right. so nail bending is a whole other topic. Uh, but there's a it's a niche within a niche. Grip sports a niche, and the nail bending is a, a, a niche within grip sport. And this is a weird contraption designed for practicing nail bending um, without having to bend loads of nails. Because you know cost money and i bought this wrist developer and the spring that it came with i was not even strong enough to do on the easiest setting so i take the spring off and instead i put a rubber band on it and it's easy and every day i put another rubber band on it and i'm carrying this thing in the car it's with me at the gym i'm doing it all day long and i'm working up until i've got loads of rubber bands and then i take the rubber band off i put the spring on and i can do it and then I roll and I grab an Americana on someone, a, 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 a training partner that I've trained with a lot at the time. And I grab an Americana on them and they just go, what the fuck was that? <laughs> and I'm looking at my wrist like, Jesus Christ, like the, I'm, I, I feel noticeably strong by doing this for a couple of weeks. Um, so there are a few instances, instances like that. Um, I mean, similar when, when I first started doing grip training, the, the initial stuff that I was doing very early on was just, uh, long farmer's walks. So my closed hand support became very strong. Um, this is back when I was training the geese. So I got to a stage pretty quickly and early on where if I got my hand into a lapel, you could not remove it. Nobody could remove it. And, um, I was not big at the time. I was about 75 kilos at the time. Um, uh, but nobody could remove that. And then it's just like, what do you do with it? Okay. So I got good at doing loop chokes that developed later on when I took the gear off into my guillotine stuff. Uh, but I was doing loop chokes and collar drags and collar pushes and stuff like that. Uh, if you want to hear a funny story about that, um, after ADCC 2011, where I competed in, if you really want to like, <laughs> really want to age me badly, um, Rodolfo Vieira, who was Mundial's weight and absolute champion at the time, came to Mill Hill to do a seminar. And I rolled with him afterwards. And um, I put my hand in his lapel. And he, and I used to let people try and strip it. Because, you know, there's it, one thing like, but I used to put it in there and go, go and cr crack on, like give it your best <laughs> shot. Put my hand in the lapel and he goes to strip it and he can't strip it. And I'm thinking, yeah. He passes my guard, takes mount and chokes me out but my hand was still on his lapel. <laughs> <laughs> it was still there the whole time. Um, so yeah, of course, of course it has an effect on, on, on your grappling. But I also, I feel like grip has the grip, uh, developing your grip is the fastest and easiest way to build strength that you will feel on the mats. You start squatting, it will take you a little while. You know, you start benching, it will take you a little while all of these things will be helpful but you start training your grip you'll start to feel that quickly you start to feel it quickly yeah that's what I was trying to get at. like what is the importance like what would you give the importance of it but obviously you just answered that really you're, you're asking the wrong person yeah. for asking yeah, about the importance a, of grip yeah. strength yeah. you know what I mean yeah but, that, but that's that, that's why I kind of fell in love with grip because yeah. because I was grappling and I was weak you, you need to understand what I was saying earlier like I was yeah. super super weak I was a, a 15 year old I was 50 kilos when I started training 50 kilos in adult classes. I remember looking at someone, they were 70 kilos. And I thought one day I want to be big and strong enough to beat him. I genuinely used to fantasize about this every day, like 70 kilo person, 70 kilo person. Now I hardly consider a, a like fully grown man. <laughs> no offense to anyone who's 70 kilos. But, but um, there was a time where I was like a 70 kilo guy was a giant to me. Um, so uh, yeah, so, so developing that strength um, had, had, you, you know, I, I, what do I have to do? I need to get stronger and you only need to grapple for a couple of weeks in order to go like, oh, if only I could hold on better, especially if it's in the gi. Um, and that's why I first, yeah, that's why I first got into to grip training and I've been doing it ever since. If you could pick one exercise. <laughs> 
<laughs> for grip. Yeah. Look, okay. It's the last time I talk about the book, promise. Uh, but the whole premise of, the, the answer to your question is impossible because that would be the equivalent of saying, you want to get your body stronger for jujitsu, pick an exercise. Go, well, what are you talking about? I just put pull-ups, by the way. But, but uh, the point <laughs> is, is like, do you want your legs stronger? Do you want your back stronger? Do you want your chest stronger? Like, do you want, do you want to be able to push more, pull more, rotate more? And grip is the same. People have a very one-dimensional view of what grip is, but it's not. It's open hand strength. It's closed hand strength. It's the ability to hook at the wrist. It's finger pressure. It's f the tendon strength. It's grabbing vertical. It's, it's all of the articulations of the wrist. There's so many different things that go into it. So when you say, give me a grip exercise, it's too vague. You can go, give me one exercise for holding onto a lapel. I'll give you one. Give me one exercise for holding onto a wrist. I'll give you one. You know, give me one exercise for, for, for doing a guillotine. I'll give you one. But, but, just one exercise? No, I can't do that. All right. I'm not going to be baited into it. That's fine. <laughs> that was a good answer. Um, okay, mate, cool. Uh, the next thing we wanted to chat about, mental health and jiu-jitsu um, and, and physical activity in general. So I think it's becoming more and more apparent that physical activity has a profound impact on, on mental health. Um, and jiu-jitsu seems to take it sometimes a step farther. I mean, do you, do you think there's a, a link between physical, physical health and mental health? I mean, anyone who says that there isn't a link between physical health and mental health is lying or has no idea what they're talking about. I mean, the reality is that physical health will improve every single thing about every single person, right? It will, like, you know, exercising, being active is a key component to being healthy. Mental, physical, other, spiritual, everything. It, it's something that everyone needs to do. Um, and it's why... A, a real ethos for me is I don't actually care what you do as long as you're doing something. People get very dogmatic about how people train and they get upset if they're not, you're not lifting weights in the most optimal way because kettlebells are not as good as back squats. I'm like, I don't care. I don't, I really, I don't care if you're jumping rope. I don't care if you're doing pogo sticks. I don't care if you're, if you, I don't really don't care. If you're out there, you find something that you enjoy and you do it, that's all that matters when it comes to mental health, in my in, in my opinion. Just get moving. That 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 is essentially the most important thing. Um, now, jujitsu is different. Um, jujitsu is interesting in a way for mental health, in a way that other other physical activities aren't. And that is the sport itself. It's difficult. Um, it's there's a lot of adversity that you have to overcome. It's challenging. It's outside of most people's comfort zones when they start. But also uh, probably a even more profound effect of grappling on mental health. There's nothing to do with the exercise at all. It's to do with the one, the community that you're building up around you. And two, something that is really important, something that I've sort of read more about recently, um, a book, a relatively new book by Will Storr called The Status Game. Very, very good book that I recommend. And it so, sort of lays out this idea that everything is about status. And status is a very dirty word. You know, you're not allowed to want status, but we do. As humans, we do. And um, that, that is essentially what we are, what we've evolved to desire. All of our decisions are basically made around increasing our status. And the status, we play different status games. You, you know, for example, you guys play the podcast status game right? You want the podcast to get better. And that fulfills something in you by getting the podcast better. And, um, and in jujitsu, there's a framework built into the sport that has a very clear progression of status. And that doesn't mean the belt system, although that helps, it's just the competence where you, you, you go and you do something that you are continually improving in. And by improving and having more and more people come underneath you, where you can help them and you are seen and respected by other people, that is massive for people. And it's massive for people because, and sort of the, the spoiler alert for the book, essentially the, um, the premise or the, the actionable advice that Will Store gives in the status game is that the best thing to do is, is play a few of them, right? Don't just play one. Because if you're just playing one, let's say the only, you know, the standard status game that most people are playing is like their career, their job, money, 
you know, that, that game. And if that's the only game that you're playing or any other games, if you're just playing one and something goes wrong in that, you get made redundant. You, and you, you lose all your status. And that's when people do crazy things. And that's when people's mental health can really suffer. And if you have another status game that you're playing, be it any hobby, but especially jujitsu where there's so, like there really is a lot of the status built into the sport itself by function and also just, uh, 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 you know, by naturally and also by design with, with sort of the hierarchical nature of it. Um, that can be really helpful for someone. Someone loses their job, but they can still go to the gym and be respected by someone else. That's massive for, for, for people. Like that. That's really cool, isn't it? Status. Never really thought of it in that way. Yeah. You know, it's, it's true. Yeah. It's exactly true, isn't it? Yeah. And um, yeah, so, so that is... It, it, it's the interest in the, the, the actual physical movement is the superficial part for, about jujitsu. That's it. I'd recommend you read the status game. It's a very good book. Yeah. Very good book. Yeah. Something you said then that, that I, I really liked was about sort of the, the ability to help other people. Mm -hmm. Because I think that's something that really empowers people and gives them purpose. And I think often people think about getting better at jujitsu is the ability to beat other people. Mm. But I think you touched on a really good point there, which actually gives you the ability to help other people. Mm. Yeah, hundred percent. If it, it don't get me wrong, there are people who, um, who really get off on beating the shit out of other people, and those are people who have problems. Like, don't make no mistake. If 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 some if you know someone who is really sadistic on the mats, who enjoys and gets off on beating the shit out of people, and don't get me wrong, I've been there. I've had that. You know, I've gone through that stage and I'm happy to be out of it. I take no pleasure in that. I mean, any more than sort of in on a playful way, like really deeply, like you want to fuck someone up because it makes you feel better. That's a problem with you. But most people aren't like that. Most people, they want to beat someone because it's competitive. You get to have, you know, we have, especially as men, but many women as well, have very competitive urges. We get to take that out in a really healthy way against someone who is agreeing to be just as competitive with us. Win, lose or draw, we're still friends with them afterwards. Um, but the idea of helping other people, and like you said, purpose is, is massive. It's far more fulfilling for me to teach a seminar and have someone be able to go to competition and do a technique than it is for me to beat someone up or even to win a tournament a lot of the time. Um, that the helping people and being able to pass on knowledge is something that I think um, when you get to a certain level of maturity in your life becomes one of the things that is actually going to give you the most amount of purpose and joy. Yeah, 100%. And just considering all those things that you've just mentioned, outside of injury, because that kind of speaks for itself, why do you think people quit jiu-jitsu? Um... <laughs> there's a lot of good reasons why um, I'm just trying to think of the best way to frame it uh, look it's it's difficult people quit it's, it's hard it's really hard and um, I think a lot of people the reason why we quit or do anything is a very complex matter I had a guy on my podcast called Simon Shear who wrote a book about the psychology of exercising and how you basically there needs to be in order for us to do anything there needs to be a promise of a reward for doing that, right? And the reward can be like food, you know, community, socialization, sex, like whatever it is, like there needs to be something. And they can get to a point where people feel like, evidently it gets to a point where people feel like the difficulty of doing the thing is no longer balanced by the promise of reward afterwards, in which case you lose motivation to do it talks about this idea there's no such thing as motivation it's simply a, a, a neurobiological chemical weighing of whether what you're going to do having the effort and energy to go do that is worth it or you're going to get the payoff so curating environments that are very healthy in a community you know communal or social way is in my opinion the best way to keep people on the mats because if you're only basing it off of stuff like endorphins from exercise and you start to lose that give it give it five or five or six years that that sort of adrenaline and endorphins and novelty of training that starts to wane you know you just go and, and, and it's still really hard or it's get you're getting older it's getting even harder so it's more difficult so the payoff has to be even greater there so i think can you you know if, if you're just going in and you're just training 
and nothing's changing in terms of the reward you're getting, but the difficulties are mounting up. You're having kids, you're getting older, you're injured. The difficulties are mounting, that balance starts to become skewed. So you have to start looking to do stuff that gives you more of a reward, you know, consciously like telling yourself, no, I'm going to do this because um, this is going to be good for me in X, Y, or Z ways. I'm going to do this because I want to go see my friends and I want to go hang out with them or whatever other reason. Yeah, definitely. I think it's that thing, isn't it, about intrinsic and extrinsic reasons to do stuff. Mm. And I think, you know, we joked at the start about how long it's been since I got my last belt. Mm. And there was a point definitely where, you know, extrinsically I was thinking about when am I going to get my next belt. Mm. And then over time I started thinking about actually when I've not been training, what, you know, what have I missed and, you know, how do I feel different? And training very much now is, is about a lot of things you just mentioned. So it's see my mates, but it's also, I don't know, I, I feel that when I train jujitsu specifically, but I certainly do exercise as well, I find that my job, my tolerance to my screaming child, you know, the moods of my missus, all that becomes far more manageable. Mm. Um, and, I, and I've recognized that jujitsu gives me that, that patience and the tolerance. Mm. And for me, that's the intrinsic reason that I keep going, I think. Do you think people stop because of belts sometimes as well? If they have a long layoff, they're a brown belt, come back, get smashed by a blue belt, and they're like, oh, fucking hell. And then they, they do. Belts are such an interesting topic in jiu-jitsu because you really like, you can make arguments for and against the necessity uh, and, and even the helpfulness. Yeah, that's what I, I, see, I feel like I see it with people because because I, I train really quite, quite regularly. And then some people obviously like dip in and out and there might be a powerful belt. And the first thing I'll say is, oh, I trained in fucking ages or whatever. Mm. You know what I mean? And you can you can al almost get the feeling like uh, they're making us an excuse before we even roll, even if we're fucking you're, you're around. Cha you're challenging the status though. Yeah. Yeah, but not yeah, but not in a no. You're not, not doing you on purpose. I mean? yeah, no, no, yeah, but you are. Yeah, yeah, you're not doing on purpose. That's well, not maybe, why you're rolling with maybe. someone. <laughs> no, I'm joking. Yeah. That, you're, that's not what. That's why. That's not why you're rolling with someone. But yeah. that's. But that's why. That's they what I mean. That, yeah, yeah, yeah. They have that conversation. Then you can see like you don't see them for a while, and then you chat to them. And they're like, oh, you know, I'm feeling like I'm just not getting anywhere. Blah blah blah. And I and I always feel like I speak to uh, my tattooist. He got his purple belt, and he's he, since he's got his purple belt. He was saying to me like he was like I don't feel like I'm ready for my purple belt, and he's good, and he is good. But he, in himself, he was like, I don't feel like I'm ready for my purple belt. And I felt like, I, I think he said at the time, like he felt like, you know, it, it did put him off training a little bit because he was like, now I'm going in. I was, you know, getting beaten up by some blue belts and now I'm going in as a purple belt. And it's like so much more pressure and, you know, all that type of thing. And you think if you took away the belts and those situations and just grappled, you know what I mean? And like, like fucking wrestling is or whatever. It would it would make all that sort of silliness go away, and effectively, then it would just be skill on the mat, wouldn't it? It's a yeah. I don't know. Yes, yes. I don't know. So, like, what what you're essentially talking about is people when they get um, given a physical a representation of their status, is they have to defend that status. Yeah, and when they're going against someone of a lower rank, there is a challenge to that status, which is questioning whether they are actually what they think they are is what other people think they are. Now, when you take those, so in theory, you go, okay, we take the belts away, but it doesn't really change that because how long you've been training for? Okay, so if I go, what belt are you? Okay, and if you're not wearing a belt, I go, how long are you training for, right? And you go, how, what belt am I? I go, black belt. And if I don't have a black belt, you go, how long I've been training for? I go, 20 years. The status is still there, just yeah. on time served. Yeah, true. So you'll find a reason to be, You'll, you'll find a reason to be challenged. Now, the important part is, under, is trying to override that sort of evolutionary desire to defend your status to a degree and understand that the status is irrelevant of other people and you're just trying to improve the skill. So, so I don't know the answer. I don't know. I don't know. I've, I came up with a grading system for no gi. Like I was the first person to do this in the UK. If you see someone with a sweatband on with a belt on it, that was my idea. I came up with that. And um, lots of lots of gyms in this country and other countries have adopted the same thing because a lot of people want, they don't want to do the work and not get the, the physical reward. They want they want the badge, yeah. want the badge of honor. Yeah, of course. Um, not just the cauliflower. What do, you, what do you feel as well about people only training no gi and then getting promoted and doing all that sort of stuff? Because I hear some people that, you know, people saying you've got to train in the gi to get fucking belts and whatever else. What's your, what's your views on that? Another controversial topic. Um, look, when I was teaching at Mill Hill, uh, 
I was running a Nogi only program and I brought in my own grading system. My grading system was separate from the Gi Jiu Jitsu. It had different colors and different numbers. You could not even connect them. You couldn't say, oh, the green, green band is a purple belt because there's five belts and four bands. Okay. So you couldn't do it. And, um, and some people only train no gi and they had their grades and some people trained gi and no gi. Some of them had similar grades that we could kind of relate. Others didn't. I had a guy who was a purple belt um, and he came to no gi and I gave him his white band because I thought he was shit. <laughs> and he said, I'm really offended that you've given me this. I worked really hard to get my purple belt and, I, and he never came, he never came to a class ever uh, after that. Um, but, it is what it is. Yeah. I was changing the status in a way that, and now I look back on it and you look at it through that perspective and you go, yeah, I mean, I might as well just fucking take a shit on his foot right <laughs> yeah, there. And like, get the fuck out of it, mate. Uh, but yeah, I came up with a grading system and it worked really well. It worked really well. Um, now, if I opened, an, the reason why I came up with a different grading system is because I was not in control of who was giving the belts out in the gi. And I didn't want to be forced because if someone was training gi and no gi, um, if someone got a blue belt, I'd have to give them a blue band, right? And I didn't want to have that. So I go, if I make a completely separate system, I can keep this person on a separate gi and no gi grading system. Now, here comes the question. If I open a gym and I was in control of both the gi and no gi grading, what, I have a grade and I give them a blue band and then I have another grade and I give them a blue belt? No, it's not going to make any sense, is it? So I would just give them a blue. I'd probably change the way that I had the system, go back to the same number of and probably even the same color belts as I had bands and just use it as you would use belts. Now, there's plenty of places where people just train no gi and they are given a belt that they're never going to wear because they don't train in the gi and it counts. I don't have an issue with it. There will be plenty of people who go, Nicky Rod not shouldn't is a white belt, never trains in the gi. You know, he doesn't put a gi on, so how can he be a purple or brown belt, whatever the hell he is? And I go, who really gives a shit? Who really cares? You're going to tell Nicky Ruddy's not a purple belt? <laughs> you want to tell him that? Like, it's just a, and, and, and I kind of think, yeah, sure. If you give, if I gave someone, let's say you train 15 years, no gi only, I give you a black belt, I sign you off on IBJJF, you're a black belt. And they go, yeah, but what if he puts on a gi and he gets his ass kicked? Because he's a, because he's not actually a black belt in the gi. I go, well, firstly, why the fuck would he put a gi on? He's only trained no gi for 15 years. Yeah. And two, there's a massive variation in ability in black belt anyway. Who cares? Yeah. No, oh, yeah. It's like Josh, Josh Barnett's a black, like Josh, Josh Barnett got his IBJJF recognized black belt. Doesn't train the gi. Right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's, it's transferable as well, isn't it? You know what I mean? I know. To a group, don't be, get me wrong. Like, yeah, there you is know what I mean? Like, you could put on, you, you could do no, no gi, put on a gi and still be good in a gi because it's the same. The game's changing even more as we go. Yeah, the, the the game is diverging even more. Ten years ago, it was pretty similar. Now, not so much. Mm. Yeah, I think for me, that's that's the the kind of key argument. I think regarding having, you know, one belt across the gi and the no gi, because I agree. I think even in the time that I've been training, that the two have gone in different directions, mm -hmm. and it's all, almost becoming two separate martial arts or sports, whatever you want to call so it. So here's the funny thing. Um, talking about that, certainly interrupt, but talking about that, the funny thing that I find is. Um, modern no gi looks more like old school gi than new school gi looks like old school gi. Old school gi jiu-jitsu, like back in the early days, was about takedowns, back takes, wrestling heavy. Uh, it was not no crazy inverted reverse Della Worm guards, which with the exception of the leg lock stuff looks a lot more like modern gi game, especially like we're moving away from legs into more wrestling stuff than the modern gi game, which would be completely foreign to Carlos Gracie. He would not recognize it as the same sport. He just wouldn't. Yeah. It's like worm guard. Yeah. <laughs> You're like, what the fuck is yeah. that? Dan, I saw you on Instagram recently with um, a chap in your grip wearing some sort of head device strapped to a laptop. Yes. And it looked like you were doing or supporting with uh, some research around... I think the impact of jujitsu on the brain. Yeah. Oh, yeah, I've seen that. Yeah. Look. Yeah. I was really fascinated. And I don't know if, um, you know, there's a conclusion or if that's been published at all. But tell us about what that is. Yeah. So that, is. That, that may never be published. Hopefully it is. But it, uh, if it is, it, it could be years. Yeah. Um, it's going to, it's a long study. And uh, this is a, a, a bunch of guys that I met through Polaris. Polaris is sort of supporting them. And um, they are doing some research into the effects of grappling on 
brain health. And the main measurement of sort of cognitive decline is brain blood flow. So they're measuring the difference in brain blood flow between grapplers and non-grapplers. And they came, their initial tests came to the conclusion that grapplers have better brain blood flow than non-grapplers. And of course, everyone goes, yeah, but they're just more in shape. No, this is balanced. This is controlled for fitness levels. So other athletes as well, control for fitness levels. Grapplers seem to have better brain blood flow. And then the thing that most people will say straight after that, it goes, yeah, but this is a thinking man sport. You know, that's probably <laughs> why I go, I don't think it's that much. You know, it's <laughs> compared to like a musician or, you know, something yeah. like, mm, I don't know, I'm your chess player. I, d I don't think so. Um, so their conclusion, it might be, uh, their hypothesis is that there's something to do with either being choked or defending against being choked or just the general like sort of tension and compression that we do in grappling that is having an adaptive uh, change to the thickness and strength of the blood vessels in the neck um, resulting in a greater brain blood flow, which is super interesting. So um, they are working with a load of athletes at Polaris. So we had our, we filled out questionnaires we did a uh, cognitive decline test and we had our, our, our blood flow and our necks measured. Uh, then they have this lab in University of South Wales, this environmental chamber where they can control the oxygen levels. So we went in there and we did some rolling in 50% oxygen, 10% oxygen. Usual oxygen levels are 21. We, we brought it down to 10%. It's so the equivalent oxygen level of just above Kilimanjaro. And no, no, no adjustment dropped a helicopter boom top of Kilimanjaro. And <laughs> man, that was weird. Is that was weird. Yeah, I'd say it's rough. It, it, it's, it's very strange. You get in there. Um, and so, so the way that a lot of these chambers that you'll see, they, they pull the air out. This one doesn't. This pumps in nitrogen to displace, you know, the, 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 yeah, the amount. Yeah, so it's very, very quick, very quick, very yeah. quick. And like, if you, if you need to, you can get out straight away. And it, yeah, it's, it's an incredible, uh, contraption. I mean, multi-million, you know, super, super expensive. What's it feel kit. like? Or do, do you feel it? Is it not? Oh yeah. yeah straight oh away, yeah. yeah. Oh, you feel it. Yeah. I mean, I, it was interesting to see some people seem to be affected much less than others. I was not the worst, but I would say that I was affected the second worst. Um, my, I, I like lost all the color in my face. Lips went blue. Your legs feel very heavy. Um, you feel a little bit lightheaded. Uh, the, the breathing, you, if you get out of breath, it takes ages to get it back. And, uh, and I did, I rolled for about two and a half minutes, not super intense, but two and a half minute proper, you know, proper roll. And I felt like I'd been shark tanked by 20 guys, 20 guys, <laughs> oh, one minute rounds no for, for like half an hour. It was crazy. I rolled two and a half minutes and I was, I was dying. I was dying. It was very, very strange. Um, yeah. So we played around there for a while and then, and then we ended up, uh, I was like, whilst we're here, let's, let's bring out the machines and let's choke each other and like check, check, uh, test the brain blood flow. And there was some, we actually got some really interesting results. We're training, a, uh, we, I was choking Gareth, uh, uh, Gareth Dummer, who was one of the owners at Tatami. And he, actually kind of we, we found out that he has some incredible adaptations like unbelievable resilience and um so he was the guy that you see ch me choking in the video um he was tough and, and you know smaller guy trains with these big lads in wales been training for 20 years black belt super tough like he is the perfect because i said to him you know they, they asked me you know how often in the question how often do you get choked i don't i don't get choked like even into positions that get choked very often at all. Whereas Gareth is fighting against these every single day against these massive guys. Um, but yeah, it was quite cool. They had him, um, I choked him a little bit and then they had him hyperventilate quite aggressively for a little while. Um, and after he stopped, the main researcher, Damien, he says to me, in a, in a, in a hundred percent of tests, the person would pass out. He said he's done the, this experiment in the, in this no oxygen environment thousands of times and he's never seen someone not pass out the first time he's ever seen it he said you know gareth was just built different <laughs> the question is was he built different before or was it three years of jiu-jitsu that he got that it's really interesting yeah it's a fascinating study mate and and when you were rolling in the um 
in the chamber, was there like any cognitive changes that could you still be uh, clarity of thought? That was one of the tests that they were sort of, you might feel a little bit hazy. I didn't feel that so much, maybe a little bit, but the physical, the breathing, the energy, oh, brutal. Yeah, it was mad. Yeah, yeah. no, it's a fascinating study because I think often people think about it the other way, don't they? And um, my, my, my other half's a doctor and she still looks at people getting choked unconscious and she's like, mm, that looks bad. So, okay, so there's another thing with, look, I'm not saying getting choked is good. We're just trying to find out. <laughs> there's certainly some instances of where getting choked can be really bad, which is, I believe it's called arterial dis dissections, which is, you know, the tearing of the blood vessels in the neck getting choked and leading to strokes or, you know, people can die from it. It can be bad. Right, okay. It's not very common, but it can happen. Um, and I was chatting to them about it and they said that generally this is caused um, if you're being choked with rotation. Okay. So it's sort of the angle and either falling funny or being choked with the neck at an angle that can cause these more harmful effects of being choked and these damages to the blood vessels. But, um, but yeah, these, these are stuff, you know, you know what, what is fantastic to see is that jujitsu is being studied. Yeah, it's interesting, isn't it? It's fascinating. I mean, it's such a, we're so lucky to have people who are enthusiastic. Um, one of the researchers who kind of kicked everything off, a guy called Ben, he's a purple belt. Um, and it's sort of thanks to him that we've got these guys, you know, he did these initial tests that we've got these guys, uh, you know, really serious researchers who have done work with like NFL players and MMA fighters and boxers that are turning their eye to our tiny little sport of grappling. It's really cool to see. Jiu Jitsu is growing so fast though, isn't it? It has. So yeah. fast. It's, it's, I think it feels like it's, I'm getting in that like, even though it's fucking 20 years down the line for yeah. me, but at like the start of it going up or it's even more. Yeah. It's an interesting one because Jiu Jitsu is a very interesting um, it has some very interesting features in that it is popular in its practitioners, not its spectators. Yeah. This is very, very different to a lot of sports. If you look, because we piggyback on the back of uh, MMA, make no mistake, without the UFC, Jiu -Jitsu, we're not having this conversation. You're not training probably, you know, without the yeah, UFC. No, no, like, no, like, no, you know, I agree. Yeah, yeah. And maybe I don't either. No, I didn't even know what it was fucking 10 yeah. years ago. You know what I mean? Uh, so the pop huge uh, explosion in popularity of jiu-jitsu is massively, almost entirely down to MMA. So we're very lucky with that. Um, but here's the thing with MMA. 99, probably 0.9% of the people who watch MMA don't train MMA. 100% of the people who watch grappling train grappling mm. <laughs> yeah it's almost the opposite yeah. right you do not nobody who doesn't grapple i mean there may be a couple of exceptions out there because they can't grapple but you are not watching grappling if you don't grapple oh yeah you know you want to have a fucking clue what's going on you just don't care and here's the thing most people who grapple don't watch grappling right show me one person who trains mma who doesn't watch mma you won't find one yeah because right? they're because they're coming from a spectator perspective first oh i love mma I'm going to train it. Jiu-Jitsu don't... Do, no one went, I love watching Polaris. I'm going to start training. I don't think that happens. <laughs> Very rarely. <laughs> it's like, do Jiu-Jitsu, therefore I go and watch Polaris. And most people who train Jiu-Jitsu don't. So we're, we're in this interesting... Uh, we're in this interesting sport where the sort of dichotomy between spectator and participant is massively skewed in one direction, which means that it's good for... Um, it's good for the sport in terms of obviously practitioners, but there's never going to be big, big bucks in it because you're never going to get... Do you not think there's a specific rule set that is going to change it? No? It, 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 look, you can play around with rule sets. It's getting bigger. I'm not yeah. saying that it's like ADCC is massive. It's got a massive bankroll from the, set, from the uh, uh, UAE um, and some events like Quintet, which are really, really exciting, but it's never going to be mainstream. It will never, ever ever be made even if every person on the planet was training jiu-jitsu it still wouldn't be mainstream because people who walk, train jiu-jitsu don't watch it <laughs> they don't watch it they don't care yeah I, I, yeah i think that's what you've been have you been to blaris before uh not live no yeah so that's a good example how long have you been training for 20 years 17, 17 years okay he's never isn't it we, we have one of the biggest uh and this is not a this is not uh uh you know i was gonna say you've only been training for a couple of years so, so it's a bit but like a lot of people haven't been to Polaris. It's, the, it's one of the biggest grappling events in the world. 
And it's kind of on your doorstep. You've got one, you've got, a, you know, events in, in uh, South Wales or events down in Southampton. It's a couple of hours away. You've never been to one. Yeah, you, yeah. You, you have a podcast where you talk about jujitsu. You see what I mean? Yeah. People just don't care. Yeah. They just don't care. Problem, what, why do you think that is though? Is it just because it's boring? Uh, yeah. 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 For the most, like it's relatively boring. Yeah. Relatively boring. And I think that a lot of it is, um, the atmosphere at these places is we haven't nailed it yet. We haven't nailed it yet. I commentate for Polaris. I commentate for cage warriors. It's the biggest, biggest, um, grappling promotion in Europe and the biggest MMA promotion you get in like Europe. Fucking Eddie Hearn involved and make it into what darts done. You know what I mean? Make it a big but, piss but, but you go, go, go to cage warriors. <laughs> it's nuts. Is it? It's nuts. Is that, yeah, I've been, fucking yeah. crazy. Is it? Why? Because <laughs> no, no, no. The people in the crowd train. <laughs> they don't train. They're just the friends of people because it's because it's a much better spectator sport. So because you're having all of these people who are there just for a good night, not to watch jujitsu, not to watch MMA. They don't give a shit. They're there to support their mate. They're there to have a piss up. They're there to, um, to do whatever else. Uh, the atmosphere is very different. So you feel like you have a good night. Whereas Polaris. I mean, the last Polaris that we did in Wales, very strange atmosphere. It was a great show, but dead energy in the crowd. Mm -hmm. So if you're going to come to Polaris, anyone watching this, make some fucking noise for Christ's sake, you know, <laughs> give some energy and, and, and it kind of, I feel like as a, a, as an audience member, what you put into being in a place, you kind of get back a little bit. If you get excited and you get on your chairs and stuff, then yeah, you get it back. Yeah, I did find the last ADCC, and I'm, I'm, this is why I asked about your predictions, because I'm genuinely excited to watch that. I yeah. really am. And the last one was a real spectacle. Um, I went to the one in Nottingham years ago. I fought on that. Yeah. And... Yeah, it's very different. Yeah, it, <laughs> yeah, just looked, like, it looked like any IBJJF tournament. Yeah, yeah, oh, really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah you know, it was, it, was, it was crap compared. But I think... Yeah, the, the effort they've obviously put into the that, that spectator element. You know, even the intros, the weird, the weird sort of commentator guy with a creepy voice. Um, <laughs> it definitely makes it. You know the guy I mean, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, it definitely makes it more more appealing to watch. But I think when it actually Still comes to the match, won't get watched by non grapplers. And I think the reason why is because then when I watch the grappling, I'm I'm almost watching like a lesson. I'm like mm. looking for the detail. I think somebody who doesn't understand the martial art can't see it. They can't, they don't know what they're looking at. It reminds me of when I went to um, UFC, it was in Manchester years ago. It was when Bisbing fought Sinazic, I think. When, mm -hmm. um, uh, what's his name? When Michael got, got, got head kicked. By Gonzaga, yeah. Yes, that event. Um, and I remember watching that even, you know, it's going back some, but I was in the crowd watching the fights and I was doing jujitsu at the time in MMA. The people around me, every time I hit the floor, would start shouting handbags yeah. and just like complaining <laughs> because they just didn't know what they were looking at. They, they, they're getting better. Yeah. MMA fans are getting way better. They, they really yeah, understand, they understand the grappling now. They understand the grappling, um, but they won't watch it. But it's the same as most martial arts. So we're never going to Taekwondo or karate or fucking judo. You know, they're, they're all going to, they're never going to be like Disagree. main street. What, they're, what they're never be, okay look at karate combat yeah but it's not really karate though is it no they're, they're, they're evolved it into something they, they have evolved it a little if they, bit if they kept it straight up karate yeah. I don't think it would be popular if they, but what they're doing is great and I love karate yeah. combat yeah. but you know they are evolving it all the time it is more like I mean. MMA like, it is more like MMA but that's because MMA is the best spectator sport oh, 100% by miles, yeah, it, it and and let's be honest, we all just like seeing being pun people punched in the face, and but that's, it's not, that's it's, what it comes down to. I think to, the it? idea is people see it, they wince, they're like, "Oh, fucking hell!" And yeah, that's I mean, it, yes, it. That's yeah, of it, course, it, you know? of course, but it is just the fact that it is the rule set with the like. I find boxing incredibly boring. Yeah, I don't like boxing. So it's like it's not about being boxing. punched. It's not about being punched. Yeah, but I it's, think it's just you know, the it's danger about, of it. It's about everything. That's it that everything can happen. You can be punched, kicked, submitted, flying on board, taken down, ground and pounded. It's, unpredictable, it's it? everything. It's, it's the fighting sport with the least number of rules. Therefore, it feels like the most realistic and that is why we love it. Yeah. I think the thing that I find with both jiu-jitsu and even boxing is there, there's periods of, of the match where they're doing nothing. So yeah. if boxing is a clinch, jiu-jitsu, it's a bit stalling. Yeah. Whereas I think to your point with MMA, because it's- I mean, it can happen. Yeah, it can happen. Usually, well, it's again, it's like fence wrestling or or in, inside guard, and you know it happens. But but there's uh, again a lot of options from every single position, and and I know having done a couple of amateur MMA matches back in the day, the fucking refs are on you quick as well mm. if you're stalling. Like, they're always yeah. in your ear. Yeah, just you gotta work. You gotta work, or they'll stand you up. So mm. interesting.
Yeah, it's cool. Uh, mate, where can people find your book? You can find it on Amazon. Just go and search it on Amazon. Um, and it's called The Grappler's Guide to Grip Training. Uh, the ebook you can get from my website, which is apeacademyonline.com. Um, the physical book, just buy from Amazon. If you're in the UK, just go to Amazon UK. If you can't find it in your Amazon, if you're in other countries, um, then go to the US site and it should be able to be delivered to you. Nice. And anything else you've got going on that you want to mention, mate? Uh, what do I have going on? Not too much. Seminar tour is sort of coming to an end. I've got a few left. This is the main last week of it. Um, I've got some, I've got another course coming out on the howdy position that I was talking about, uh, uh, last night. Um, that will be out in the next couple of months. I also have a new, I've got a new product coming out, the saw bell, which is going to be coming out late June or early July. My first invention. Okay. Tell us about that real quick. You not seen it? No. Is oh that man. Yeah. Yeah, I've seen it. So um, it, the idea was I wanted to create a training device that you could push and pull, right? So generally you have the work push and pull in isolation. But of course in jiu-jitsu, you're, you're working them both at the same time. So how could I create something that obviously you can't put like a band or a cable on both sides because they're sort of canceling each other out. So I thought the best way to do it would be with friction, so I like had a kettlebell on the floor and I was dragging it back and forth. I was like, eh, maybe. And I sort of thought in my head, you know, the kettlebell's a bit unstable. So I thought like a uh, a, a plane, you know. Um, and I mocked something up in wood in my shed and took it to my buddy, Sean, who, uh, who makes a lot of my stuff. And he mocked up this prototype of the saw bell. And I got contacted by a company called factory weights up in Scotland who wanted to help me put it into mass production. So we've got hundred units coming over from China at the moment. Um, all powder coated looking nice. And, uh, hopefully that will be out in the next couple of months. Awesome. Yeah. Sounds sick. Dan, appreciate you coming on mate. Awesome. Thank chat. you very much. Thank, thank you. Mate. Cheers, brother. Cheers, thank mate. you. Thank I appreciate you. it. Thank you.